Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? Woo. I invite everyone to stand up. And before we get started, I want you guys to grab the person next to you and shake them. Be like, wake up. We're here in chapel. We're here to praise the Lord. And you know what? Matthew 17, 20 says, because you have so little faith, truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Do you guys agree with that? Yeah, amen. You know what I got to say? Si tuvieras fe como grano de mostaza, eso lo dice el Señor. Si tuvieras fe como grano de mostaza, Eso lo dice el Señor, tú le dirías a la montaña, muévete, muévete, tú le dirías a la montaña, muévete, muévete, esa montaña se moverá, se moverá, se moverá, esa montaña se moverá, se moverá, se moverá, esa montaña se moverá, se moverá, se moverá. Esa montaña se moverá, se moverá, se moverá. Si tuvieras fe como un ano de mostaza, y eso lo dice el Señor. Si tuvieras fe como un ano de mostaza, eso lo dice el Señor. Tú le darías a la montaña, muévete. Muévete, muévete. Esa montaña se moverá, se moverá, se moverá. 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 Esa montaña se moverá. Se moverá, se moverá. Esa montaña se moverá. Se moverá, se moverá. Let's go. There's that mountain's moving right now. Tú le dirías, tú le dirías a la montaña, muévete, muévete. Tú le dirías a la montaña, muévete, muévete. Esa montaña se moverá, se moverá, se moverá. Esa montaña se moverá, se moverá, se moverá. Esa montaña se moverá, se moverá. Esa montaña se moverá, 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 se moverá, se moverá.
Father, I just thank you, Lord. Help us just to receive your word. I pray that if there's any conflicts or any stress, any anxiety in any of us as we come into this, Lord, I pray that you just give us peace, Lord. Just watch over us. I pray that we receive what you want us to receive. Help us to attune our ears to your word and just to listen to you today, Lord. I thank you for helping us uh, wake up this beautiful morning that you've created, Lord. Lord, your grace, your mercy, Lord, we thank you for all of it. So I just pray that as we go into this word, that we just listen to you, Lord. And we just hear what you have for us. In your name I pray. Amen. Every nation. 모든 나라. Et tu saw du du. Kol amma. Cada nación. Chaque nación. Kila Taifa. Mega Gordia. Amen Yergir. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united in Christ, algún consuelo en su amor. Algún compañerismo en el espíritu, algún afecto entrañable. Llénenme de alegría teniendo un mismo parecer, un mismo amor, unidos en alma y pensamiento. Fan shi buke, ji shi ji li, ai mu shi rong, yao xin chun qian bei, kan bieren ji ji qiang. La tan zuru kulla wahed ila ma hua le nafsi. بل كل واحد إلى ما هو للآخرين أيضا فليكن فيكم هذا الفكر الذي في المسيح يسوع أيضا كبنن 원래 하나님의 모습을 지니고 계셨지만 하나님과 동등하게 되려고 생각하지 않으시고 오히려 자기의 모든 특권을 버리시고 종의 모습으로 사람들과 같이 되어 in being found in appearance as a man he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death even death on a cross. Eseganon o bagolok owe moni oche gaeyankon ononimo egon serala egon binang dudu. Inayato tuli o tuli vai uma lava ile suafa o yesu. Oe oe le langi, mae oe le lalo langi, mae oe lalo le lalo langi. Eke tout lang confesse que Jesus Christ est Seigneur, a la gloire de Dieu le Père. Yev amen lezu tavani te Jesus Christos dere hide astuzo parkin hamar. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Oh man, watching that video just made me smile. It's so beautiful to hear the word of God in so many different languages. Before we get into the message, I have a couple of announcements for you all. So we have our fall global engagement trips that are still open. So if you're interested in that opportunity, make sure to sign up. The team will be going to Ensenada, Mexico, and uh, they'll be building a house for a family that's migrated there. Um, and also they'll be working with the local orphanage and with the after-school program called Baja Ed. So sign up if you are interested. My second announcement today is that the gap year's deadline has been extended. So if you are interested in a gap year, make sure to sign up. Gap year stands for go and prepare. 
So this is really a program that's been designed for students to take two years after their graduation um, to serve, potentially in a community that's never heard about Jesus before. So if both of these things or one of these things interests you, make sure to sign up, visit the OSD website um, or even the Instagram page for more information. So today, as you saw in the video, we are celebrating Global Vision Chapel. Give it up. Oh, I'm so excited to be here. So we are celebrating this, and we've brought in two pastors, Pastor Alexandra and Pastor Emmanuel Moon. They're joining us here today, and it is my privilege to announce them. So they are pastors who have had significant experience abroad, but they also are co-pastoring a church in Escondido, California here, and um, they are wonderful, wonderful people. They have a background that is unique. Hopefully, they'll get to talk about it a little bit, but um, they uh, co-pastor, and they really have a heart for missions. They, Pastor Emmanuel has a heart to develop fruitful disciples and um, to empower people, and Pastor Alexandra has a heart to lead the miss missional church, and she, very much like we do, believe that it starts here to our, in our surrounding communities and to the ends of the earth. So please help me in welcoming pastors Alexandra and Emmanuel Moon to the stage. Okay, buenos días, mi gente. Welcome, um, actually, good morning, people. <laughs> Bienvenidos a la casa de Dios. Welcome to the house of the Lord. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to talk <laughs> Spanish the whole time. <laughs> but let's address the obvious right now. You see my black eye, right? Yes, okay, I, was, I wasn't born that way. Um, so have you guys seen that bus sign on the sidewalk? Yeah? I haven't. So that's why, no, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. I do play soccer in the soccer league um, down in Escondido Saturday nights, and I went for a header. I got the ball, but the other guy didn't. He got my face, so I've had this black guy for, for a couple of, uh, a few days already. Um, but, so you can stop looking at my black eye, and you can start looking at my wife's beautiful eye, yes. Thank you. <laughs> so like they say, our names are Alexandra and Emmanuel. Um, and we wanted to start by sharing a little bit of our testimony of where we're from, where we grew up, what we did with our lives, and what we're doing right now. So I was born in Chile and raised in Puerto Rico. So Spanish is my first language, so forgive my accent. <laughs> and I was raised in Puerto Rico, grew up there, and since I was seven years old, I knew I had a heart for ministry. So I started preaching when I was seven years old, and around age 15, uh, I decided I wanted to be a missionary. I wanted to be a missionary. With, I really wanted to go out in the world and make disciples and preach the gospel. So when I was 16, I started traveling the world. I went to Africa. I went to India. I spent a summer in China. I went to South America, Europe, all of these gaining experience, learning about the global church, learning about how other people worship and have faith in God. And then I came back, uh, as, as I grew up, I went to college, um, which is wonderful. College life is the best. <laughs> so take advantage of it. So when I was in college, I majored in biology. So I thought I was going to be a scientist. Um, I majored in uh, limnology, which is the study of fresh water. And at the same time, I was in the soccer team. I play other sports. And when it was time to graduate, I had to make a choice. I either uh, was going to go to Australia to grad school to continue my studies in hydrology, but God had other plans. God sent me to seminary uh, here in the US, the least favorite country in my list to go and spend the rest of my life. Um, <laughs> so I came here uh, to actually Pasadena to Fuller Theological Seminary and the first day I arrived there, I met Emmanuel. <laughs> first, it was like You're this. welcome, you're welcome. <laughs> 
So, yeah, the rest is history. Um, uh, right now, we are pastoring a church, a bilingual church in Escondido. We have three beautiful boys, um, seven and under. So, life is crazy. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, now it's your turn. And a little background um, about me. So, I was born and raised in Bolivia, South America. Do we have any Bolivians? Oh, I heard some. Woo! All right. Santa Cruz de la Sierra. Um, <laughs> And my parents are Korean. I lived most of my life there. After graduating from um, college, I pastored the church for two years in Bolivia. Um, I was raised in a Christian home, but I didn't really understand salvation until age 14. Because up to then, I was just repeating, right? I was a parent. Okay, yeah, my parents are going to church. I go to church. But it was a transformation in that moment where I really considered, like, what, what is my faith? Because I was going through an identity crisis as well. Like, who am I? <laughs> right? Um, so that was a turning point. That's when I decided to um, serve God. So after that, I went to Korea. I had to do my military service in Korea. After finishing my military service in Korea, I also started um, volunteering in some churches over there. And then God said, well, here's an opportunity for you to continue your education. Came to Fuller um, and got my master's in divinity. And that's where I met this beautiful Puerto Rican. <laughs> and uh, it's been a journey, right? And we want to share a little bit more about that as we share about identity. Yes, and the reason we started uh, telling, uh, telling you our backgrounds, our family history, where we came from, um, our hopes and dreams when we were young, is because all of these things, all of these stories and backgrounds, they form a really important part of who we are. They have a big impact on our identity, uh, but they shouldn't define entirely who we are. Right? They, we are not to dismiss them because they give us a, new, a unique and specific story to our lives, but there's something else that should, should shape who we are as a person. And many people may say that all these things are like a puzzle, right, uh, uh, to our identity, a puzzle pieces to our identity. And there is a story in the Bible that speaks really well into this, and, and you might have heard about it, and it's the story of Gideon. And the place and time where, Gideon, where we find Gideon is the time of the judges. And it was a very troubling time uh, in the story of the people of Israel because by this time, during the life of Gideon, they had been attacked by these people called the Midianites. <laughs> And these people were really interested in how they attack, their attack tactics. They will come with their herds of camels and just in the time where they were about to, to harvest their crops. And they will come and ransack everything, take all of their food, take all of their animals and leave them with nothing. They will leave the Israelites hungry and weak with nothing to call their own. And it was during this time of hunger and desperation and uh, solitude and, and even, uh, and even this uh, so terrible time in the lives of the Israelites that we find Gideon, that the Lord finds Gideon. And the Israelites will go into caves and hide in there. So we find Gideon hiding in a wine press. And I want to I wanna read Judges 6, 11 to 13. It says, Then the Lord's messenger came and sat under the oak at Ophrah that belonged to Hoash the Abyssalite. His son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to hide it from the Midianites. The Lord's messenger appeared to him and said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. But Gideon replied to him, With all due respect. How many have heard that? My Lord, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Were all his amazing works that our ancestors recounted to us saying, didn't the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and allowed Midian to overpower us. When somebody tells you with all your uh, due respect, it usually means that they are not receiving what you're telling them or they're not accepting what you're about to say. And when the Lord encountered Gideon, when the Lord came to him in his hiding place, Gideon's first response was, wait, hold on, wait a minute. Don't you see what's happening around me? Don't you see how much I'm suffering? 
Don't you see how my people are hungry and weak and desperate for salvation? Don't you see what's going on in my life? Where have you been? Where have you been in the midst of all of my suffering? Haven't we all prayed like that at some point? You know, I have. I have prayed like that many times in my life. And, but the first, time, the first thing I want to tell you this morning is that all those circumstances that are going around in your life right now, the things that are happening, your test, your problems, your family situations, even the things that are going around in the world that might be so overwhelming to us, to, the, to us, those things don't define who we are, our identity. We've all had our share of sufferings. I have experienced poverty. I have witnessed violence in my country. I have gone through natural disasters and seen my country utterly destroyed by it. I have lost three babies. Even last year, I broke my knee <laughs> playing soccer. And to this day, I'm still recovering from it. And then on top of that is the day-to-day -day stresses of life. Right? You hear me? Do you have stresses in life every day? <laughs> right the day to and you don't have three kids three boys <laughs> right that I don't want to wear my shoes right when we're about to go to school that I don't want to eat that you know all the stresses of life work ministry all of these things can be so overwhelming but they don't get to say who we are if I remain in my circumstances long enough, like Gideon hiding in the wine press, I am giving power to my circumstances to dictate who I am. To give me definitions like overwhelmed, defeated, coward, not enough. And that's not what God had in mind for you. Trying to establish your identity from the world it's one of the trickiest things to do. So growing up in Bolivia, no matter how fluent I spoke Bolivian, right, I was always the other guy, right? And wherever I went, even though I spoke perfect Spanish, they would say, hey, do you know how to Chino? <laughs> do you know how to speak Chinese? I was like, okay, I'm Korean. But no, I don't know how to speak Chinese, right? Um, and it's just that concept. And then I went to Korea and I thought, okay, I look like every Korean. Right? I look very Korean. And so, but once I start opening my mouth, I am not. It's like, oh my, you are not Korean. You're in, your Korean is not fluent. And so I'm still what? The other. And I would try and try, and it would be so frustrating because I wanted to fit in. But somehow, wherever I would go, I would find the most awkward group of people. And they're called the TCKs. Do we have any TCKs yet? Yeah. Okay. They somehow understand right that we don't fit anywhere but there's a group that will love you and take your awkwardness right and your weirdness and so but even then I truly had to find something because at the end of the day they are people and people have opinions right trying to build our identity around people it's like trying to ask you know an opinion about what should go on a pizza topping you'll get all kinds of answers. And even some as weird as pineapple. I mean, like, I don't know who says that. But you can't because it's changing. And I've had the experience too where one day I have someone come and tell me, hey, you are the greatest human being I've ever met. And all it took was for me to say something wrong or to rub that person the wrong way. And all of a sudden, that person comes and tells me, man, you are the most horrible person I have ever met. I was like, wow. Like, from night and day, like one day I'm like, oh, yes, I'm wonderful. And then the next day I'm like, oh, man, I'm trash. Can't believe this. So you can't base your identity around people's opinion either. And I tried. And I didn't get anywhere. Gideon had that influence. So when we read the next scripture, right, Gideon actually says his clan is the weakest. I mean, who told him that? Someone must have told him that. And then he says, and I am the youngest. So someone must have said something about 
what it means to be the youngest. I'm the oldest, so I know what old people, older brothers say to younger brothers, right? Like, you're weak or you don't know anything, man. Get away. <laughs> um, so he heard all these things. And he comes before God and says, God, this is who I am. In Judges chapter 6, verse 14 and 15, it says, Then the Lord turned to him and said, You have strength. You have strength. So go and rescue Israel from the power of Midian. Am I not personally sending you? But again, Gideon said to him, With all due respect, my Lord, how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the youngest in my household. And the story continues with the Lord reassuring Gideon over and over, I am sending you. I am with you. You have nothing to worry about. But Gideon said, mm, not sure about this. I need one more sign. I need something that will tell me that it's really you who is speaking to me and choosing me in this moment. So he asked the Lord to wait there until he comes back. And Gideon in his mind is trying to find, I want to bring the best I have to offer. I want to bring the best I have, my best offering to the Lord. So he goes back home. He brings his offering. He brings it to the place where the messenger was. He put it over there, the meat and the bread. And then the messenger uses the staff, touches the offering, and it bursts into flames. And it consumes all of the offering. And then the messenger puffs disappears we can all agree that that was a good enough sign <laughs> to tell Gideon that that was definitely the Lord speaking to him and then this is what Gideon says this is how he responds in verses 22 to 24 then Gideon realized that it had been the Lord's messenger finally Gideon exclaimed oh no Lord God I have seen the Lord's messenger face to face but the Lord said to him, peace, don't be afraid, you won't die. So Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it, the Lord makes peace. So our identity is also not defined by what we can offer, by the best thing that we can do. In an effort to find true to what he was hearing from the Lord, he made such a big effort to bring his best offering, the best he could offer. And sometimes, if, we, if we're honest, we relied a little too much on what we can do, on our abilities. We all have that one thing that we're really, really good at. It could be music, it could be sports, you could be a nerd, you could be whatever. Whatever you're good, I was a nerd. <laughs> I was a nerd. I'm part of the club. You could, be, you could be an ace in everything you do. You could have the best grades. You could be the best singer. Whatever it is that you can be best at. But if we rely in, in those things, the minute we face failure... We encounter failure in whatever we do, our identity will crumble. Because that then our best was not even enough. Then what are we going to rely on if, if not in that? And we live in a society where um, all of these things, the things that, uh, that we are best or our best effort are highly valued especially in the season of life that you are right now where literally everything you do everything you're best at all the knowledge that you accumulated and how you apply that knowledge all of that it's been constantly evaluated and critiqued and even graded right so what happens when you fail and that thing you were best at it's not good enough anymore what do you rely on? And from the very beginning of Gideon's uh, story, before he even presented to the, to the Lord his circumstances, his family history, his cultural background, uh, his best offering, before all of that, the Lord had already given him a clear identity. That identity was already formed by the Lord. We read already in verse 12, the Lord's messenger appeared to him and said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. 
that was his identity from the very beginning. And Gideon just had to find out what that identity and just believe that he could use that identity for the thing that God was calling him to. The Lord was with him, meaning his image was in him. And mighty warrior, meaning the power of God was with him to do the thing that God was calling him to do. So when you're in the business of doing God's work, when you're in the business of doing kingdom work, it usually doesn't come down to what you're capable in your own strength, but what you're capable through God's strength. Because when God called me, right, at the age 14 and said, okay, Emmanuel, would you be willing to serve me? And I said, yes. I didn't say to God, oh, I'll take this calling, God. I've got it. Don't worry about it. You just hold, you know, sit tight and I'll take care of all of it. No. There was zero confidence when God called me, right? Zero. And it's this struggle and this uncertainty and this fear. Like, what if I fail, God? You call me to be a pastor, but what if I fail as a pastor? Or you call me to be a teacher. What if I fail as a teacher? What if I don't know enough? What if I'm not ready enough? And you can have just a myriad of excuses. And on top of all that, you have doubts, right? Out of all the people, God, why me? Have you ever asked that question? Out of all the people, why me? And this is the way that God responds whenever I come to that situation. God says, well, of course, my child. I chose you because you're my child. And that's huge. You are the child of the most high God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. You are his child. And he's ready to step with you into every new thing in your life. I love this verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 5.17. It says this, right? And you know it. So then... If anyone is in Christ, that person is part of the new creation. The old things have gone away, and look, new things have arrived. I love this new identity in Christ because it focuses on the newness of what God wants to bring in your life. It focuses on the newness that God already sees in you. But we often sabotage ourselves because we want to bring up the past. Oh, but God, don't you remember when I failed this? Oh, but God, don't you remember when I couldn't do this? Oh, but God, don't you remember when, you know, I wasn't enough? But God says, no, no, no. I'm seeing now you, my child, and what I can do with you today and tomorrow. And today, you are new. Today, you're beautiful. Today, you're enough. Today, you can do it. Today, I am with you. Today, we'll get through this. Amen. And so this verse tells us how we are a new creation. All the things that used to define who we were are in the past. Now we know that our identity is defined by the image of Christ. And once we understand where our identity comes from, once we understand that we bear the image of Christ in us, we can recognize that we belong to a family of Christ image bearers that transcends any human category of classification. And we are experts classifying and putting people in, inside boxes. It, it can be geographical location, place of origin, family history, church denomination, political affiliation. Whatever it is that we put people in whatever box, we need to see them as cry image bearers and us as part of that family of God that doesn't, doesn't matter where you come from or who you are or what you look like or what language you speak of. We share that same identity. And understanding our belonging, our belonging to a wider family of believers, that understanding will change the way we see other people how we relate to them, how we love them, how we treat them, and ultimately it will define our purpose. If we read this verse 17 within the context of where this verse is between 16 and 19, we get a better idea of what is the purpose of this new creation in us. It reads, so then from this point on, we won't recognize people by human standards. Even though we used to know Christ by human standards, that isn't how we know him now. So then, 
If anyone is in Christ, that person is a part of the new creation. The old things have gone away. And look, new things have arrived. All of these new things, there's a purpose, are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and who gave us the ministry of reconciliation. In other words, God was reconciling the world to himself through Christ by not counting people's sins against them. He has trusted us with this message of reconciliation. I remember when I first arrived to the church that we are currently pastoring in Escondido. It was a predominantly white English-speaking church uh, congregation. And, you know, looking like we do, uh, English being our second language, being Hispanic. Um, he's kind of Hispanic, oh, he's very, you know. <laughs> but <laughs> I knew it was going to be a challenge. I knew it. Not only for them, but also for me. God was calling me to the country I didn't want to come. <laughs> God was calling me to the country, I, 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 to a country I wasn't born in or even I didn't even grow up here. God was calling me to minister in a language I felt uncomfortable with. But it went really deeper than that. It was more than, you know, a, a strange place or a strange language. God was calling me to minister to a group of people that I had already formed preconceived assumptions about them and that I really didn't feel comfortable relating to. God had to do a deep work in me to remind me every day that my real identity was a new creation in Christ, a person that don't recognize people by human standards, my human standards, a person who was entrusted with the ministry of reconciliation and that needed to put aside all these assumptions that I had in my mind, all my discomfort, and needed to start seeing people as God saw them. And I was never to be fully obedient to God if I didn't start seeing God's new creation in people, even if they were different, even if they had a different color of skin, even if I spoke a different language, even if they had different family values and different societal traditions that I, to this day, some of them I don't understand. But even if they were different than me, I needed to see the new creation that God had put in them. I needed to see them as Christ image bearers and see myself as part of this big family of God where we share that same identity. Amen. So we want to encourage you to never lose sight of that. That identity that we have in Christ that was given to us with a high cost, right? With such a high cost for us to enjoy and enjoy one another and enjoy the richness and diversity of where we all come from. But somehow, when we come here in this space, in this sacred space, we're one. We're loved. We're cherished. And we have hope. So let's keep that unity together as we share that identity in Christ. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for your presence here with each and every student Father, we know that you have great plans to send them to every corner of this world. And as they go, they may never forget that they carry your image, that they carry your identity, that you're proud of them, that you love them, that you're with them, that you call them mighty. And we just ask in the name of Jesus that they will never forget just how much you did for us and how you continue to do so much for us that we may feel and know the power of your love in us. We pray your blessing of presence as we continue to go forward, Lord God. Let us rest in your truth and in your truth alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.